Okay, well, um, welcome everybody. My name is Stacey Matrazo. I'm the executive director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Um, thanks for joining us for today's webinar, A Beginner's Guide to Creating Habitat in Your Home Landscape. October is uh, Native Plant Month, so what better time to talk about adding Florida natives to your landscape? For those of you not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitat through education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Our work is made possible primarily from the state and renewal, or excuse me, the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. This is our old look that you see. Here's our new-ish look. We've had it for a couple of years now, but whether you have the old or the new look, you are supporting our programs and we thank you. Your um, purchase and renewal of the license plate also entitles you to membership with our organization. So if you have either of those plates, please let us know and we'll get you set up in our database. So those funds along with donations and memberships um, allow us to support and create projects that build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. We'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. Be sure to check um, our website for resources on planting and growing wildflowers, um, to learn where to see wildflowers in bloom, and to find out about our upcoming events and more. We're also on social media. You can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. Uh, next month, we have Anita Camacho, president and founder of the Tampa Bay Butterfly Foundation, and she'll be presenting Butterflies of Florida. That's on Wednesday, November 16th. You can register for that on our website. And we have some really good field trips coming up. This Saturday, we'll be at Ralph Simmons State Forest. Uh, that trip is currently full, but we do have a waiting list. So um, if you go on our website, you can, um, you'll be able to send us an email and get on the waiting list and we'll let you know if any spots open up. Next month, we'll be going to Leonia Preserve in Deltona. And that trip promises a Florida scrub habitat with garbaria in full bloom. Um, that's an endemic species. You'll only find that here in central Florida and it is absolutely uh, wonderful to see. So um, you can register for that on our website as well. And be sure to follow us on social media to um, keep up with all the things that we've got going on. I have just a couple of housekeeping items to go over. All attendees are muted and cameras are off. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature. You can enter your questions at any point and we will um, address as many as we can at the end of the presentation. If your question is not answered, you can also email it to us at info at FLA Wildflowers and we will get you an answer. Um, this webinar is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel and our website um, in about 24 to 48 hours. Once it's available, you'll receive an email from us with a link to the recording along with a research pa resource page with links from the webinar. So uh, without further ado, um, let's just jump right into it. Um, I am your speaker today. I'll be talking to you about my journey of creating um, a habitat, a native habitat in my home landscape. So when we when we were talking about converting our landscape to native plants, we, we are really talking about creating habitat. And it's really important um, because here in Florida, we are one of the most biodiverse states in the country. We have more ancient species and families than any other state. We have about 2,800 native plant species um, so a lot of diversity, a lot of unique endemic plants like the garbaria that um, we'll be seeing in November. But we're also one of the fastest growing states in the country. We have about 1,000 people a day moving here, which means we are developing about 170 square miles a year of our natural lands to accommodate this influx of people. And when we develop those natural areas to accommodate the growth, we're losing that diversity that makes Florida so unique. And we're pushing our wildlife into our urban areas where they can't find the resources they need. But we have an opportunity to help. We can use our urban landscapes to help mitigate the loss of that diversity and to bridge the divide between those fragmented and shrinking natural areas and provide habitat and pathways for birds and pollinators and other wildlife where they can find the resources they need. 
the slide behind. Um, so what we need to do is just raise the bar for what we ask of our landscapes. We do so much for our yards, especially if we have a St. Augustine lawn, there's so much energy and efforts and time and money that goes into it. But what we should be doing is saying, hey, landscape, you can work for me. We can do that. And we can do that easily by reducing the amount of turf grass and non-native plants in our yards. We, you know, we, we mow and herbicide and fertilize and create these beautiful, quote unquote, beautiful landscapes that have very little to no ecological value. But if we take out some of that turf grass, which is basically devoid of any, um, any, any ecological value and reduce the non-native species, we can really bring that back to life. We also wanna incorporate more native plants, take out those old ones, transition from the non-native ornamentals and or worse, our invasive species and bring in those natives. And you may not know, but a lot of our common landscape plants are actually categorized as invasives. That means that in the natural world, the plant has displaced or hybridized with natives. It's altered the natural community structures or just otherwise caused ecological damage. There's no law prohibiting the sale of these plants, unfortunately. So you can actually go to big box garden centers and purchase plants that are um, negatively impacting our ecology. Um, you see lantana in the upper left. This is touted as a pollinator plant. Sure, pollinators like it, but it's really hard to eradicate once it gets into our natural areas. Um, it's toxic to some animals, especially cattle, and it's just all around a nuisance plant. But this is something you can go purchase anywhere. We do have native lantanas. Um, they aren't um, as multicolored as this, but they're just as beautiful and they actually do what they should in our native landscapes. Um, you also see fountain grass here, which is very common in a lot of new developments. Wedelia and Mexican petunia on the bottom spread by underground runners, so they're really hard to control. Wedelia also um, spreads vegetatively, so you can, if you're collecting some of that out of your landscape and you leave a piece or two behind, it's going to re-sprout and regenerate. All of these plants are invasive for a reason. They don't have a lot of pressure here from other species. There's nothing that keeps them in check and they have become serious problems. So know before you purchase. Um, if you're focusing on native plants, which I hope you are, that's why you're here today, then you don't have to worry about these things. So we need our landscapes to do more than just be pretty. They should play a role in the ecosystem. They should provide resources and so when we, when we do that, when we make that consideration, we are inviting wildlife into our landscapes. And that's, again, what we want to do. We do this by planting natives, removing invasives, and reducing or eliminating the non-natives. And when we do this, we also encourage our neighbors to do the same. When they see this beautiful landscape alive with activity from birds and butterflies and other wildlife, they'll want to do it too. And if you do it and your neighbor does it and their neighbor does it and so on and so forth, we are creating connected habitat, connected resources, safe pathways for our pollinators and our other wildlife to move between natural areas. So Florida native plants in particular are very well adapted to Florida's unique conditions. We have a lot of craziness going on here. Uh, we have drought and fire, we have lots of rain, we've got humidity, salt, wind, all kinds of things impacting our plant life. But our native plants have been here for millennia. They're adapted to those conditions. They know how to survive in those conditions better than our non-native species. They're also adapted to the wildlife that have lived here and evolved with them over a millennia. So they're better suited than the non-native species to provide the resources that they need. And of course, they shouldn't require as much water. They don't need, shouldn't need, if you plant the right plant in the right place, they shouldn't need fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and so on. So all those chemicals that we're using now to have our ornamental and manicured lawn, we can eliminate that by using native plants. But in order to create habitat, we need to consider the diversity, the needs of the wildlife. So when you're building your palette of plants, you want to consider different habits or different plant forms. 
wildflowers um, can create a very pleasing aesthetic. They're beautiful, but they also supply nectar and pollen for our pollinators, nesting opportunities for many insects, seeds for birds, and a lot of those flowers that attract insects also attract the birds that want to eat the insects. Um, vines are really good if you have a limited space. If you can't plant out, you can plant up, sort of. <laughs> if you give it a trellis or something to grow on, most vines are going to be pretty happy in a home landscape. But they, again, also provide food and cover for wildlife. Grasses are really important, too. They give movement and texture to a landscape, and they literally help support wildflowers. In nature, you often see wildflowers and grasses growing together and in close proximity. So we have a lot of tall, lankier um, wildflowers that are literally held up by the grasses that surround them. So think about that and you're adding it to your landscape. Grasses also offer seeds and cover for birds and other wildlife, and they, um, provide nesting material, and they also help with erosion control. And then finally, trees and shrubs are really essential to a healthy, sustainable landscape. They can be a centerpiece. You can plant them together and create um, a privacy screen or a hedge. They also host a variety of micro habitats. So lots of other organisms living in those shrubs and trees that are then providing food for many of our birds and mammals. And our shrubs and trees also provide nesting opportunities for wildlife too. So thinking about, unless you have a meadow, unless you're looking at acres of just open grassland, most habitats, or excuse me, most home landscapes will really benefit from the inclusion of all of these different types of plants. You also wanna choose plants that are blooming throughout the year. You want your landscape to be a, a haven for wildlife, no matter what time of year it is. So when you're picking wildflowers and flowering shrubs and grasses, look at their bloom time and make sure you're including some that bloom in spring, summer, and fall. And we do have some that actually bloom uh, in the winter as well. You also wanna include host plants. Um, nectar plants are great. They feed our butterflies, but if those butterflies want to lay their eggs and create new butterflies, they need to have host plants. So look at the pollinators, the butterflies that are in your area and figure out what those host plants are and incorporate some of them into your landscape as well. You also wanna choose plants that provide fruit and seed throughout the year. So just like you have flowers that provide nectar and pollen, you wanna provide the fruit and the seed and the things that other wildlife need throughout the year, as well as some evergreen um, dense foliage for nesting and for cover or shelter. And then if you can add other resources too, that's always helpful if you have the ability to add a birdhouse or a bee condo. Um, I have a brush pile that I have a big oak tree and we just throw twigs that fall and sticks. And I have a black racer that's living there now. And we see lizards and other wildlife crawling in among it. Um, it's a really good thing to have if it fits into your landscape. You also wanna make sure you're selecting the right plant for the conditions of your landscape. Um, is your landscape mostly sunny or covered in shade? Different plants like different sun conditions. Is your soil moist or is it dry and sandy? Again, different plants like different conditions. What part of the state do you live in? We have plants that are native throughout Florida, but they don't all work throughout Florida. We have some plants that are only occurring in the northern part of the panhandle or perhaps in the southern part of, of the state or in the Keys. They may not work in other parts of the state. So you wanna make sure that the plants that you are selecting are suitable for the hardiness zone in which you live. It's also gonna help um, dictate whether or not the plant will survive, but also how much maintenance is required. And make sure you're buying from trusted sources. Always know where your plants come from, um, the plant's origins in particular. Uh, we do have species that are native here that are also native to the Midwest and to Colorado, for example. So just because a species is native doesn't necessarily mean it was grown here. And if it was grown somewhere else, again, in Colorado, those conditions are very different. High altitude, different soil components, different temperatures, bringing that plant to Florida, it's not gonna do as well as a plant that was grown here. So look for nurseries that specialize in native plants. 
Um, check out plantrealflorida.org to find a list of nurseries in Florida. They have a map, actually. You can just go find one that's, that's in your area um, and check them out. You can also, excuse me, purchase seeds from the Florida Wildflower Growers Cooperative. They specialize in Florida native seed, and that's what you want. Or purchase from your native plant society chapter. Uh, this is plant sale season, guys. So a lot of our native plant society chapters are hosting native plant sales. So check with your local chapter and see what's going on. And finally, make sure you're not purchasing plants that are invasive. Yes, I just talked about this, but it's really important to reiterate. If you don't know if a plant is invasive, be sure to find out before you add it to your landscape. You can check floridainvasivespecies.org for a list of all category one and category two invasive species, and please avoid them. So now we have a basic idea on, on things to consider when converting part or all of your landscape to natives. I want to share my story with you. Excuse me. So this is a before shot of my house. So my partner and I were condo residents for 12 years and we never had the opportunity to create or our own habitat. But a couple of years ago, we moved into this house with a yard and we knew immediately that we wanted to create a native landscape. And the original yard you can maybe tell from the picture, but it was kind of a mess of turf and non-native weedy ground covers. There were some ornamentals like the non-native thai and ginger plants and some liriope, lots of things that really um, weren't providing anything to wildlife. We also had some invasives, uh, Mexican petunia, which I just showed you earlier, was uh, kind of running rampant in my yard, in my backyard especially. Um, you can see over here, if you can see my cursor, but on the right-hand side of the screen is this lovely patch of mother-in-law's tongue um, next to the oak tree. And then just behind that, we have a hedge of Suriname cherry, another invasive but commonly used um, plant. So nothing desirable in our landscape. And neither myself nor my partner have a landscaping background or experience. So we didn't really know exactly what we wanted to do. We just knew that we wanted the lawn gone and we wanted to replace it with a dense native planting of wildflowers, grasses, and shrubs. We kind of had the trees covered. We've got quite a few oaks. Um, so we didn't really need much help in that area, but we did want to incorporate all those other plant habits or plant types. We also wanted paths. We knew that even though we have a small yard, we wanted to be able to walk through it. We didn't want to just see our garden um, from you know behind or in front of. We wanted to be able to walk through it so we could enjoy it. We could really get up close. It also helps with weeding. If you have paths built into your landscape, it gives you access to, to everything. So when you're weeding, you, you're able to actually get in there easier. So the first thing that we did was look through a bunch of resources to come up with a wish list of plants that we personally liked. And that's a really great place to start. If there are plants that you like that you've seen um, in other native gardens in your area or in natural areas around you, find out more about them, especially if you've seen them in conditions that are similar to what your home landscape is. Then you can check with a local nursery and see if they sell them. Learn what conditions they require and whether or not they're suitable for your yard's conditions. And then if they're available, that might be the place to start. And we have tons of resources here at the foundation to help you select plants for different conditions. We have an aquatics handout, dry landscape, shady landscapes. We sell our book, Native Plants for Florida Gardens, which features 100 readily available native plants. Um, so lots of information on our website to help you get started. And all of our resources have these little icon keys that make it really easy to, at a glance, know what the plant's moisture conditions are or requirements, what the sun requirements are, when it's gonna bloom, what color, kind of those basic things that you wanna start with as you're narrowing down your plant palette. Um, you can find a lot of that with our resources. So we came up with some ideas of plants that we liked. And then we contacted Green Isle Gardens, which is our local native nursery. I'm in Orlando, they're in Groveland. They're not very far from me and they are an amazing source for native plants. Um, but they came out, excuse me, and looked at our landscape and helped us put something together. 
Um, a lot of native nurseries do provide design services. Uh, so definitely if you want help putting something together, reach out to um, the nursery in your area and see what they can do. But working with um, Green Isle and working off our wish list, we came up with this preliminary design. And as you can see, this is just a sketch on a piece of paper. It wasn't created in CAD or some other design software. It's just a sketch. Green Isle offered some guidance on how we could group plants together for more impact, both visually and for the benefit of wildlife. You want diversity of species in your landscape, but you don't wanna take a one of everything approach. So if your yard can handle say a hundred plants, um, you'll wanna select maybe 10 species and 10 plants of each, as opposed to 50 species and two of each. So abundance of species and then grouping them together is most effective for the pollinators, and again, visually, it just provides a nicer aesthetic than you know, just kind of throwing everything anywhere. The biggest challenge we had is that most of our yard is um, partly to mostly shady, because we have a lot of oak cover, but we do have a couple of areas um, down here on the, near the road and then up here and little spots over here that are mostly sunny and very dry. So we needed a different plant palette for each area. And so you can see, and you know, we've made some adjustments to this, we've crossed things out and added things, but over in our shady area, we've got oak leaf hydrangea and some ferns, some shade perennials, species that are more tolerant of shade, but then moving down toward the street where it gets sunnier and in our other sunnier spots, we've got plants that are more inclined toward a sunny, or liking more sun exposure, and also being a little bit more tolerant of the drier sandy soils that um, are in those particular areas. Along the road too, our landscape kind of slopes down as it gets toward the road. So we decided to incorporate a lot of grasses in this area because that will help with the erosion control. So we had a plan, something to start with, right? What, what next? Well, we knew we wanted to do it ourselves. We wanted to have that hands-on experience of, of just start to finish doing it all, planting, creating this garden that we had dreamed of. And we wanted to save money. You can hire a full service company to do it all, but it does cost more to do it that way. And our yard's not that big, but it's still an undertaking to completely redo a landscape. So we decided to do it in smaller sections. And if there's one thing I recommend, especially if you're gonna do it yourself, is start small. Even if your goal is to replace your entire landscape, which was our goal, breaking it up into smaller sections will help with the workload and kind of spread that cost over um, however long you choose to take to do this. So the paths in our design created sections automatically and it gave us something to work with. So as I mentioned, our yard was mostly undesirable ground covers, lots of things we didn't want. So ultimately we knew we had to clear the entire yard. And there are a few ways you can go about this. And this applies to a St. Augustine lawn as well as um, a weird mix of, <laughs> of stuff like I have. Um, the most effective way to kill ground cover is solarization. And this involves covering the ground in a clear plastic and letting it sit for six to eight weeks the plastic creates this greenhouse effect, which you can see in the photo on the right. And it basically kills off not only the top layer, but depending on the heat that it's generated, it can often penetrate into the soil and kill off some of that seed bank too, the weed seeds that are gonna be you know, fighting to, to come up after you've done your landscape. But this method is only effective when the sun can penetrate consistently for many hours a day during that period. So it's most effective in the summer when the days are longer and hotter. Our landscape is mostly shade or a lot of shade. And we were doing this in March. So this is not ideal conditions for solarizing. And I'm personally not a huge fan of plastic. So I wasn't really interested in having to manage this kind of um, waste. And that is something to think about too. It's a lot of plastic that doesn't have a whole lot of other use once you've completed the solarization process but it is very effective if you use it in the right conditions at the right time of year. Another um, option is sheet mulching. Um, this involves covering the area that you wanna plant 
with cardboard or newspaper, something um, that will break down over time and will not harm the landscape. You cover that with mulch and cut holes in the cardboard where you want to put the plants and you plant them. And the mulch is going to help keep the cardboard in place. It's going to help that cardboard break down and it will help suppress weeds. This is really better for smaller spots. So if you're just doing an island of your yard, for example, or you know, part of your right of way or just a smaller area, it can be effective for that. Since we were doing our entire landscape, um, we would have needed a lot of cardboard. Uh, this is, these pictures are from, excuse me, a demonstration garden that we funded in Gainesville and they chose to do um, sheet mulching and it was very effective. Weeds were not a problem at all for them. So the option that we went with, <laughs> because these two were not going to work for our conditions, we decided to scrape the ground clean. We bought a sharpened flathead shovel and literally scraped the top inch or two of, until we hit bare soil. And you can kind of see it. We have a lot of oak leaf litter. So even though we did scrape the soil, it was quickly covered by oak leaves, but that's not a problem. Oak leaves are great for mulch. They are, they're, they're fine, they're native. So it wasn't a big issue. Um, to be honest, scraping the landscape was not the easiest thing to do. A lot of what we were scraping were pretty resilient plants. So it took some serious elbow grease to sever them and get them off the landscape. Um, I have to admit, I was not the one doing this, my partner was, but it was a lot of work. If you're gonna do this, make sure you get a file to keep that shovel sharpened. You'd be surprised at how quickly it dulls, even when you're not hitting much, but you know, vegetation, it does dull fast. And when you scrape the site, there's also the issue of disposing all of that removed stuff, all the weeds and grass that you've removed has to go somewhere. So keep that in mind. You can see in the um, upper right, this is the dumpster bag that we had to rent to dispose of it all. Um, it blocked our driveway for quite a long time because we had to keep it somewhere off of where we were working. And because it was rainy, we also had to cover it with a tarp to keep it from filling up with water. So, you know, maybe not ideal. These are just different options that you can, that you can use to, um, you know, if you're gonna do this to your landscape. All of these are options that eliminate the need for herbicides. And that's really what we're trying to go for is we don't wanna promote the use of herbicides of any chemicals that you have to put onto your landscape. Those chemicals are gonna penetrate the soil. They're not healthy for the plants that you're putting in. They're gonna run off into our gutters and into our water and just cause a whole host of problems. So if you can avoid using herbicides, highly recommend it. But this was, a, this was the option we went with, again, because it saved us money. Um, we didn't really know how much work it was gonna be until we got into it, but we stuck it out. But if you don't want that job or responsibility, you can pay someone to do part of this process. You can pay someone just to clear your landscape. You do have options there. So over a span of a couple of months, we would clear a section, we'd go get plants from the nursery, get them in the ground, and then when we felt up to it, we would dive into the next section. But by starting small, it allows you to see how the plants are gonna do. You'll learn what works, what doesn't, before you invest the time, money, and energy into you know, your whole landscape or into a whole bunch of species that maybe aren't the best choices. Um, this was our first haul of plants. So certainly the more plants that you have, the more full your landscape's gonna look, but you also need to consider how much space the plants are gonna need as they mature. We had a lot of wildflowers and grasses, and that was good because we could plant them really close together and get that full effect without having to worry too much about what was gonna happen because those plants are not going to double, triple in size over the years. But if you're getting shrubs or trees, you're not buying those at full size. So you need to make sure that you know what's, what's the potential of that plant? How big is it gonna spread out? How tall is it gonna get? To think about that, where you put it, and then what you plant around it. And of course, the more plants you buy, the more it will cost. Um, that said, if you know other people with native landscapes, you might be able to get some starter plants for free or maybe um, find someone with seeds to share. We have several species that reproduce prolifically in our landscape and they don't necessarily end up where we want them to be. So we started potting them up and we occasionally give them away 
Um, we'll post on social media, we'll tell our neighbors, anybody walking by is allowed to just come and take a plant. So consider joining either a neighborhood group or a native plant group or native gardening group on social media and keep an eye out for opportunities. I'm not the only one doing this. This was not my idea, uh, but it's really fun to do. Um, something else to consider when you're doing this for the first time is to get comfortable with failure. Sometimes plants die and you won't know why. And it's very frustrating, but even with the best plants, even when you purchase the plants that are you know, best suited for your conditions, there's sometimes unexplainable loss. Our soil was, I think, a little more acidic than we realized because we have so much oak leaf litter throughout the year. We have so many oaks that are putting tannins into the soil as well. Um, oak leaves and pine needles contain tannins that can affect the pH of your soil, and that can um, affect a plant's or impact a plant's success. So planting around an oak tree also presents some challenges because of the tannic content and because the trees have extensive root systems. So you don't want to disturb those, and those roots are going to compete for nutrients with the plants that you're trying to put around there. So um, you know, I have three oak trees and what works and what doesn't with each of them is very different. But with that in mind, don't be afraid to experiment. Some plants preferred conditions might be a little more flexible, meaning that the moisture level or the soil type or the sun conditions, exposure conditions are things you can play with a little bit. Um, you know, don't put a full sun plant into deep, deep shade or an aquatic plant in dry sandy soils. That's a bit of a stretch. But if you have something that tends towards sunny, but maybe handles some shade, you can push it in a little bit more shady or, or in a little bit moister environment and see how it does. It's especially once you've kind of got your foundation established and you start wanting to fill things in, um, you know, then it's a really good time to start experimenting. But be patient. These plants don't get big overnight. Um, and so, you know, again, when you're starting with small, a lot of the plants you're going to purchase are one gallon, three gallon pots. They're, they're going to be tiny. Um, give them, give them the time. Know that it's not going to happen overnight. The wildflowers and grasses are probably going to fill in much quicker. Um, usually it's just a season or two, um, but your trees and shrubs, most of them are going to take quite a while to, um, to reach their full potential. So here's that lovely before shot again. Then we've got, um, these were our first planting. So you can see where we put the um, pads in. We um, simply collected fallen branches from our yard um, while we were clearing it and then from the neighborhood. We just walk around our neighborhood. There's so many oak trees. Um, people are putting them out by the curb all the time. So we use those to line the pads to create separations from the planted areas. And we also opted to um, apply a layer of mulch on those paths to give it a finished look. So this can be an important tool for dealing with neighbors. Um, neighbors don't always understand what you're doing. A lot of people have this idea of a very manicured, neat St. Augustine lawn. Um, people often think that native means it's wild or untended, but if you add paths or a low fence or you know, some other more formal features, and I use that term loosely because you can see my, my branch lined path is not formal, but it gives the landscape a finished look and it can help people interpret what they see and clarify visually that you're not just letting your yard go. And if your paths lead to your street, it can also be an invitation for people to come in and get closer. We sit on our front patio all the time, waiting for neighbors to walk by. Just you know, all they need to do is look over and we're like, hey, let's talk about our yard. Um, but it's great to have conversations with people so that they know what you're doing. And once they understand it and see it, we hope that they will want to do that too. Um, one word about mulch though, if you want to use mulch to line a path or apply it around your newly planted shrubs or trees, the only mulch we recommend other than oak leaves or pine straw is flora mulch. This is a great alternative to cypress mulch. Please don't use cypress mulch. We are losing our old growth cypress trees to support that product, that industry. But flora mulch is made from melaleuca, which is an invasive tree. So um, it needs to be eradicated anyway. And it provides the same aesthetic. It's sustainable. 
and it lasts a while in the landscape. I don't really, I've, I've only mulched my pads. How many years have we had this? I probably mulch like once a year just to refresh it and give it a nice new look, but it's really takes a while for it to um, break down. So now we have this amazing yard with so many um, pollinators and other wildlife. We still have a ways to go, but um, you know, and, and there are areas that have failed. We have learned over time that some of the plants we've tried are not um, as happy. So we are having fun just watching this happen and then finding new, um, new plants, new opportunities to enhance our landscape. But really, the, the, so yes, it's going to take a while for it to be finished, if it ever really is. It's a living landscape. So, you know, I don't ever envision it being completely finished. But the joy, the serenity, the, the everything that you want from this is instantaneous. You don't have to wait for everything to fill in and, and reach its full potential to experience what transforming your landscape into native habitat can do. And I'm telling you, if you plant it, they will come. We got all the bugs and the birds and the other wildlife pretty quickly. And my partner even started an Instagram account just for our yard. So we have every bloom, every bug, all the life in our landscape documented. And it's really amazing to see the diversity of all the wildlife that our native plants bring in. So I'm going to talk now about a few plants that we use that are pretty easy to establish. And that's something to consider too. If you're new at this, start with plants that are easy and adaptable. You're likely to have more success. And when you have success, you are encouraged to do more, right? We don't like failure. It's part of life. But if we have success, that kind of gives us momentum to keep going. But once you see how things do, then you can get a little bit more experimental. Um, this is powder puff or sometime mimosa. It is a perennial prostrate mat forming ground cover. It is excellent for dry disturbed areas. Um, it's a really great alternative to a lawn. Um, it's low growing, it spreads readily, it can tolerate being mowed. So again, if you have a situation where you have to do that, um, I said again, sorry, I gave another talk this morning and I'm thinking of, of what I said then. Anyway, if you have a landscape that uh, for some reason you have to mow an area, this is a good alternative um, that you can mow, keep it up about five or six inches, um, the plant will come back, it'll bloom readily and it's, it's great. We have this down, um, in that dry spot near the road, because it's got, it, it shoots out um, its stones and then it drops roots. So it's continually climbing along the landscape. So we've added that to that grassy area to help with the erosion control. And because it's a super dry, sunny area and this plant does really well there. Um, it typically blooms in spring and summer. It's pollinated mostly by bees, but it does attract butterflies as well. And it's a host plant for um, the little sulfur butterfly. Uh, this is salvia tropical sage. This is one of the ones I give away because if you have one salvia, you have hundreds. <laughs> I'm not kidding. These are the most prolific seeders. Um, they produce these long spikes of blooms and these blooms have tons of seed in them and they are super easy. They, they um, uh, germinate very quickly. So we have a lot of them coming up and I don't mind that, but it's easy enough because I have so many to pull some out and give them to friends and neighbors. Um, the red one you see here on the left is the, the main species, but on the right, you see a white and a pink variety. These are um, natural hybrids that have been cultivated. If you plant a white one and a red one nearby, you'll get your own pink one. So they, this does happen um, genetically and naturally. But these are great plants for attracting butterflies, bees, even hummingbirds love these red tubular um, flowers. It's a summer through fall bloomer, but here in Central Florida and further south, it does tend to bloom year round. Ours bloom year round here, we've, they've never stopped. And they're supposed to only get to about three or four feet, but I have some that are taller than me. I'm 5'2", so <laughs> maybe six feet we're topping at. I can't explain it, but um, they're just really super easy beautiful plants that are great for pollinators. This is porter weed. Um, we use this, so in that kind of center island, we planted a coral bean, which is a nice upright shrub. And so around its base, we planted a ring of, of porter weed. 
It's a fairly low growing plant, um, not really a ground cover so much as maybe uh, about a foot tall, but it does stay low and it spreads out. Um, this is great for um, attracting hummingbirds, believe it or not. These flowers are tubular, even though they're tiny, hummingbirds do like porterweed. Butterflies too, we get tons of golf fritillaries on our um, porterweed. Um, the flowers are ephemeral, so they'll close up at the end of the day and they don't open on, uh, on cloudy days. They like lots of sun to show off their blooms. But it does good in a container as well. If you um, are looking for plants that are suitable for containers, this is a nice one, or even a hanging basket. Um, don't confuse this with the non-native quarterweed. Our native quarterweed is low growing. It will spread out. We have one that looks almost identical, but it's upright, and that is um, not native. I believe it's invasive. It was at one time and it might still be, but this is the one that you commonly find at um, big box stores. So definitely make sure you're getting the native porterweed if you um, choose to incorporate this into your landscape. This is uh, green eyes. This is one of my favorites because it has a, a secret smell to it when it's fully open and, and the flowers in its, its most open state it actually emits a subtle chocolate scent. Um, it doesn't last very long. So if you have it in your landscape, you wanna keep an eye on it and um, you know, get your nose in there. It's not a big, a strong smell, but it's absolutely wonderful. This is a really easy to establish wildflower. It does great in dry sandy soils and full sun. It, once it's established, um, produces a big thick tuberous root that makes it very drought tolerant. So um, it just, it, it puts on this beautiful display. So it can form these large clumps and it produces a lot of blooms at the same time. And it's just, it's very striking. Um, in the upper left, you see what it looks like when it goes to seed. So even after the flower, the bloom is gone, it's still got a very interesting aesthetic to it. Let me see, I've never done video in a presentation, but yes, that worked. Um, so keep an eye on that video and just look at all the stuff buzzing around there. This is dotted horse mint, um, also known as um, spotted bee balm. It's a member of the mint family, and it's probably the best bang for your buck pollinator plant. It attracts, this is not my videography, by the way, <laughs> this is my partner's, um, but it attracts so many different pollinators. You can see there's just so many things buzzing by. There's bees and wasps and flies and, and all kinds of different pollinators on this plant. Um, it's really amazing. It's super easy to establish. It's very adaptable to a variety of conditions. Um, it spreads pretty readily. So either give it a lot of room or plant it somewhere where you can control it or it can be controlled. I have it in one spot. I have a power pole that the previous owner put these paver bricks around. And so it kind of created a natural bed with a barrier. And so we just put horse mint in there with some other ones and it keeps it from moving outward. But it's a really great plant. You can make a tea out of it too. It's got kind of a nice oregano flavor to it. And, um, but the super, if you're gonna get one plant for pollinators, this is probably it because it just attracts so many pollinators and it has a really long bloom time too. Uh, this is um, firebush, another great one. Um, probably the best plant for attracting butterflies and birds. It has um, these red tubular flowers, so uh, butterflies, especially the zebra longwings, we see them all over uh, this plant. Um, but other butterflies like it too. It can bloom year round. It also produces these nice little black berries or dark purple berries. Um, it produces the fruit and the flower at the same time. So it's attracting pollinators, it's attracting birds and other wildlife. It's evergreen, so it's foliage is providing cover throughout the year. Um, just a really great plant. Um, you can use it as a specimen plant or create a border or mass planting out of it. It's also pretty tolerant of salt and wind, so you can use it in more coastal areas as well. Um, it can tolerate full sun to full shade, but if you plant it in full shade, it's going to be a little leggier and you're not going to get as much bloom on it. The more sun it gets, the more blooms you get and the denser the foliage as well. And that's true for a lot of our flowering plants that are shade tolerant. Um, we have two kinds of milkweed in our landscape. Because we have a very dry, sunny area, we chose the butterfly milkweed, which is the um, orange flower on the left. 
It uh, only gets to one to three feet tall. It has a pretty minimal spread. It brim, blooms spring through fall. Um, it does not tolerate shade well, and it does not tolerate a lot of moisture. So that spot up at the front, I planted it actually alongside the green eyes. So that yellow flower that smells like chocolate, those conditions are really good for the milkweed as well. But on the right, you see the white swamp milkweed. And this one's another low growing milkweed. It only gets about a foot or two tall, depending on the conditions. It blooms spring through fall, but it can tolerate shade and it likes moist, well-drained soils. So not super mucky organic soils, but a nice well-drained soil that keeps, that is relatively moist all of the time. Um, both of these uh, and all of our milkweeds are larval hosts for the monarch, queen, and soldier butterflies. So good to have in the landscape. So they have somewhere to lay their eggs. And of course the blooms are very attractive to um, bees and other butterflies and, and pollinators as well. Don't confuse these with the non-native tropical milkweed. That's what you're typically finding in the big box retail garden centers. Um, we have a handout on our website about the issue with monarchs and the non-native milkweed. Um, that's a presentation unto itself, but um, please, if you're interested in learning more, check that out um, and make sure you are buying native milkweed only. Um, this is uh, goldenrod. We have, I think, four different species of goldenrod that are generally available at your native nurseries. Um, it's another great one for attracting a variety of pollinators, wasps, bees, other insects, and birds that are searching for insects. Birds like this plant because it's pretty easy to pick off the insects. It has a pretty long bloom time, um, summer and fall in North Florida, but as you get further south, it goes um, more spring and fall. It's easy to retain in the landscape. This one is um, seaside goldenrod, and that's our biggest goldenrod, but that's what we put. We have a nice stretch along our driveway that runs along our window, our living room window, but our house is up on a crawl space. So I needed something tall that I could see. This is a great one. It gets uh, six feet. I think we have one that might almost be seven feet tall, but generally it's around four to six feet. These beautiful big, um, spikes of yellow, bright yellow, just sunny wildflowers, um, really easy to grow. The seaside goldenrod does spread pretty readily on its own, but because mine's contained in a bed, I'm not worried about it. But if you have an area, you know, you keep an eye on it or let it do its thing, let it expand. Our other goldenrods are smaller and not quite as spreading. So um, there are other goldenrods that are suitable if you have a smaller landscape or just don't want the impact of this kind of big giant plant. Um, just a few others. Um, this uh, is Liatris on the left-hand side. We have, I think, four species of Liatris that are generally available. They produce these long spikes of purple flowers. This is a good one for small spaces. Even though it can get up to four feet tall, it does not require a lot of horizontal space. So really easy to grow in a small wildflower garden. It's an excellent nectar plant. Butterflies, bees, moth, all kinds of insects love it. Even the occasional hot hummingbird. Um, birds will eat the seeds. This is a late summer to fall bloomer. So you know it blooms alongside of the goldenrod. It makes a really nice uh, companion plant to that too, that beautiful gold and purple combination. It also pairs really nicely with our native grasses. Um, that kind of just wand-like appearance coming out of a big bunch of grass is really um, quite stunning. We do have some non-natives that are sold. Again, I can't say this enough. Make sure you know what you're buying. Make sure you know where your plants come from and that you are actually getting the native species. On the right is partridge pea. This is an annual, so it does disappear on you, but it produces a lot of seeds. So if you have one plant, you'll get more. Don't worry. Um, it's a larval host for many of the sulfur butterflies. It has this beautiful feather-like foliage. Um, nectar glands on the base of the leaf stems attract small insects that then attract birds. Um, birds also like to eat the seeds as well as other wildlife. Um, but this will bloom spring through fall, so a really long bloom time, despite the fact that it is a short-lived or an annual or short-lived perennial. But it does great in disturbed areas, um, and it's a nitrogen fixer, being a member of the bean family. So it can actually help improve or enrich your soil, and that might allow you to introduce other more demanding plants in that area. 
Um, and just a few more here. We've got Rattlesnake Master, which is a, just a crazy looking flower with some agave spiky leaves. Um, the brown eyed Susans in the middle put on a nice big clump. So lots of, you know, fills in space really nicely. The Carolina wild petunia in the upper right is a good ground cover alternative, and it seems to do pretty well around the base of an oak. Everyone wants to know, what can I plant around my oak? That's the one of the few wildflowers I've had success with. Um, we used a few different grasses. On the left is piney woods drop seed, which is, a, I think, a very underutilized bunch grass. It's a beautiful very thin, wispy, low clump grass that has these really tall kind of, you know, three or four, three feet or so flower spikes that are um, just very interesting. On the right is Fakahatchee grass. Um, you may have seen that in the full picture of my landscape, the big bunches of grass. Um, that is the flower from it. And Stokes Aster in the middle is another easy um, wildflower that a lot of different bees enjoy. So yeah, we went from this to this. There's those back of hatchies in the back. We've got love grass and muley grass. We did a whole lot of grasses in that area because of that slope and wanting to keep the erosion down. Um, this is what it looked like the other day. We're getting into fall and so our grasses are starting to turn a little brown, but even that, that's an aesthetic um, that's a little bit different, but it's to me, once you get used to what native plants do, it's still very attractive. And even though those grasses are turning brown, that's nesting material. Try to leave that stuff in place because a lot of wildlife will utilize it either for nests or actually um, live inside there. So every day there's something new. We have this living landscape with so many flowers and pollinators and birds and reptiles. And it does still have a long way to go, but we are really having fun just playing around with it. Um, and, and again, that, that joy that we get from seeing all the different things that are coming to our landscape, that happened immediately and it continues to happen every day. So you know, we wander the garden on a regular basis looking for new things in bloom, new bugs we've never seen before. Even pulling weeds is, is a labor of love because we're so excited about what we have done. Um, it really connects you to mother nature when you can create this kind of space in your landscape and and that's it's also very therapeutic in my opinion um, again if you need help getting started we have tons of resources visit our website flawildfires.org you can find over 300 plant profiles um, downloadable versions of all of our popular handouts and brochures and most of them are now available in spanish as well so that's exciting for us um, we have a guide for choosing native plants that has over 125 plants with a really easy, that quick key thing that shows you all the different um, icons and, and makes it very easy to narrow down your plant selections. Um, our 24 page publication, 20 Easy to Grow, gives you all the information you need to know on purchasing, planting, growing, and caring for 20 different genera, actually, of wildflower species. And of course, my personal favorite, I might be a little biased, but this is the book that Nancy Bissett and I wrote, Native Plants for Florida Gardens, which features 100 readily available, easy to, uh, to grow native wildflowers, grasses, shrubs, vines, and trees. Um, and that's available to purchase on our website as well. So whether or not you want to do your entire landscape, a small part of it, even if you don't have a lot of land and you just want to um, make a container garden, every little bit counts. Bring habitat into your landscape, provide some resources for those pollinators, for other wildlife that rely on them and that need them because we're, we're, we're taking their lands away to accommodate us. So let's put a little bit of it back into our own landscapes. Um, if you have questions, uh, well, certainly I'll take some questions now, but you can always email us. Um, again, follow us on social media. We post a lot. We have lots of good information and definitely check out our website as well for all of those um, helpful resources. And now, um, now I take some questions. Hey, Stacey, um, this is Emily. So Rose and I have been kind of tackling um, the, the questions as they've come in, but there have been a few uh, that are more specific to your yard. Um, so one is, what is your typical maintenance for your yard? How much time do you, would you say you spend? 
It's hard to quantify it because the way the way we approach it, like I said, I, I sit out my front patio all the time. So I can't go out there without finding weeds. Um, weeds are going to be a problem regardless of what kind of landscape you have, have. But when I sit down, my eyes immediately zone in on something. So I tend to just do a little bit every now and then. Anytime I'm out there, if I'm walking through the path, I'll pull something out. It doesn't really take a lot though. Um, we've taken the approach to let some species stay. So we get a lot of Spanish needles, the white daisy with the yellow center. Um, that is native. I know a lot of people think it's a weed, but it's a really important um, nectar source and pollen source for honeybees and other pollinators. And because it's native, we let it grow. Now, I don't let it take over. I do pull them out periodically. But so we let things like that kind of fill in um, whereas other people might see them as weeds. We've got quirky stem, passion vine that volunteered here. So we're letting that kind of do its thing. Um, we've got pony's foot, which is another native ground cover that's coming in in spots. So we're really kind of just watching it and, and letting some things go that we didn't plant. Um, but as far as maintenance, you know, it's really a few minutes here, a few minutes there, or, um, you know, maybe an hour at a time occasionally. It's not that I don't feel like I spend a lot of time weeding the yard. The one thing I do have issues with is I have a, an oak tree that sends up lots of shoots and that is regular maintenance. There's nothing you can do sort of taking out the tree when your oak starts doing that. And I've been told that's because the roots may have been damaged or the tree is, was stressed, this was happening before we moved in. So we're trying, we planted wild coffee and some other larger shrubs in that area to try and mask it a little bit, but we still spend probably, um, you know, an hour or so a month cleaning out or clipping back those oak sprouts. I'll just add to that. When I visited uh, one of our demonstration gardens in the Panhandle recently, uh, Bob Farley, who manages that garden, basically said if he can get an hour in a week, um, he feels like it keeps it under control. And that's a big, that's, you know, a big demonstration garden as well. So um, I think yeah. it's is really easy. And if, if you, if you include ground covers, that really helps keep the weeds down too. So I've got shrubs and, and larger wildflowers planted, but then I've planted swamp twin flower and um, salvia micella, uh, creeping sage. So some, some things that are going to naturally cover the ground and that's going to help keep those weeds down too and minimize that that time needed to maintain it great all right um somebody asked what are good options for borders for beds in a native landscape hmm um I guess it depends on um you know if you want the plant to be the border itself um, gra bunch grasses are, are pretty nice for that because they kind of mean, you know, they keep that shape. Um, they're not going to spread out too much. They're, they're generally going to kind of maintain that look. So you can line a few bunch grasses together to create a border. Um, something like blue eyed grass does well. Um, even the mimosa, the mimosa, you can literally just come and trim it. So it may not be what you'd think of as an ideal border. But um, you know you can you can kind of prune it back and make it do whatever you want, and it's not going to be impacted by it. Um, I'm trying to think of other plants. I mean, we've used the the oak branches as a border, so I don't really have any plants that are meant to do that. But um, grasses are really what come to mind, especially the lower ones, like that piney woods drop seed that I mentioned is a really good border plant. Um, or you could use low-growing shrubs um, like a conradina um, or a calamint if that works in your landscape. Um, you know, something that you can prune or keep um, in the size that you want that's not going to overtake, but that can remain small. All right, we've got a lot, oh, got a lot more questions coming in now. Let's see. Um, I don't know much about this, although I've read some. Someone asked, we've had an encroachment of basket grass. If it's the native variety, is this beneficial to overall habitat? So we have basket grass too, and I cannot tell whether it's native or not. 
So I kind of had this love-hate relationship where some days I let it go and then other days I rip it out because I don't know. I know you can tell if you inspect the flower uh, under a loop or a microscope, you can tell the difference, but um, I have not been able to figure that out. It is a really effective ground cover if it's the native species. Um, I don't know much about wildlife use though, and I haven't seen anything utilizing mine. Um, but I think the bigger issue is figuring out whether it's the native or the not. And I would suggest if you can take a sample to your local UFI Fis Extension office and they may be able to key that out for you. That's a good idea. Okay, let's see. Um, someone is asking about milkweed. Um, they say I have dry soil, but it would be shady or partly shady under pine trees and not much sunny areas. Is there one that likes dry and shade? How much shade are you talking about though? If you have pine right. trees, you should have some dappled sunlight, which can be okay for um, milkweed. You do see our native milkweed in, um, in pine habitat. Um, it just depends on how sunny, how much sun actually breaks through. Um, if it's pretty consistently shady, uh, the, the tuberosa, the the orange butterfly milkweed's not going to, to do very well. Um, the others, the, the, the white one that I have and the pink one too can tolerate more shade, but you really have to have consistently moist soils. Um, I'm not sure, Emily, do you know about um, Verticillata, the world milkweed? Oh, yeah, I mean, I would agree, though, you have to at least have some dappled sunlight coming in. And if you do, um, there are a few like the the world or even the um, scenario. Oh, my Latin is really bad. Um, but even but the butterfly weed, like you mentioned, if you do have some dappled sunlight, um, it may be less full. Um, mm -hmm. One in full sun, but it, you know, I've seen butterfly weed growing amongst that kind of, like you said, that kind of habitat, so. I would give it a try. I mean, it may not flower as prolifically as you'd like, but it's still gonna be a larval host and it's still gonna provide food for, for the um, caterpillars. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, someone is asking about the regional alliances um, and if there's one in Southwest Florida, um, and if not, is it because we need someone to lead? A one in that area. <laughs> yeah, we don't have an alliance, a formal alliance in Southwest Florida. Our formal ones are in the Panhandle and North Florida. Um, we don't have a lot of um, activity down in Southwest Florida yet. We are working on expanding our reach down there. The alliances tend to be more oriented toward our, our roadside pro programs. Um, and we just don't, yeah, we don't have a lot of uh, volunteers down there. We don't have a lot of activity in terms of roadsides or otherwise. So if someone's interested, email us, let's, let's talk and see, you know, what we can do. Cause we, we're trying to get an alliance in every department of transportation district. Um, but like I said, right now, we only have two active ones. So we would love to, to talk to you and see how we can get you involved. Um, another question uh, relates to wild, uh, wildlife uh, enjoying your plants maybe a bit too much. Um, and there's a question about potentially managing uh, rabbits, but I know people sometimes also experience a similar thing with deer. Um, Stacey, I'll throw it to you to see if you have any suggestions, but this is another one where I would also suggest reaching out to your IFIS extension um, and, and seeing if they have any, any strategies for you. Yeah, I live in a very urban area. I'm in a neighborhood just south of, of the downtown area. So we don't we don't even have an issue with rabbits. I know rabbits really like Coreopsis and a lot of our um, you know, our our, veg our, our wildflowers. Um, and, and I don't know, I, I plant for wildlife. So, you know, there are times, I mean, the milkweed's a good example. I planted that to feed the caterpillars and it's devastating to walk out and see it decimated, but that's why I planted it. So it's doing its job and I try not to get too attached to it if, you know, if, if I can, if I know what's eating it. 
Um, I don't really have too much issue with, with pest wildlife. Everything that um, we've seen in our landscape is, is something that I'd like to see here. So, um, you know, I, I guess it's, it's a matter of what your intention is. And if you're planting because you want to bring in food for animals, then you're going to have to expect the animals. The deer are a little bit bigger. I mean, a bigger issue um, because I know they can, you know, they can browse a plant down to nothing and um, sort of wrapping it in chicken wire or something. I'm not really sure how to manage that. Um, but uh, the IFAS extension is a good resource for that too. They may have some other ideas for keeping the unwanted wildlife out of your landscape. Great, all right, well, we're winding down here. Um, someone is asking about milkweed for Southern Florida, uh, the 10A area. Um, I don't know the range of all of the milkweeds. Uh, Stacey, do you have any suggestions? Um, we do. So the orange milkweed, the butterfly milkweed, um, we do have two subspecies. We have a North Florida and a South Florida subspecies. So you should be able to find um, something suitable down uh, in South, for South Florida. I'm trying to think. I think the perennis, the white milkweed might have that range, but not the pink one. I'm, I'm not sure offhand. Um, but I recommend checking with your native nurseries. There are some nurseries down in South Florida that specialize in native plants and see what they're growing, see what they um, have available and what they recommend for the conditions of your landscape. Definitely. And then just the last question, um, someone asked if you could share that drawing um, plan design in your slide um, with them. You mean with them not now? Yeah, I think maybe like as a part of the um, resources that we send out. Sure, sure we can do that and I can get back to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can send a, a, I can send the scan out. Yeah, and I'd be happy to answer any questions offline if someone has a question and wants to email me about what we've done and, and how some of this has changed. Cause it's not, you know, what we have now is not exactly what we expect here, but it was just a lot of trial and error to, um, fill in when things didn't work out. But yeah, I'd be happy to include that. Great, well, that is all the open questions we had. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, again, this is gonna be available on our YouTube and our website within the next day or two. We'll send you resources and a link to the recording. Um, if you like what you see, if you like what we do, please consider becoming a member, joining, uh, becoming a member, same thing, um, making a donation or purchasing that state wildflower license plate. Um, that helps us do the type of programming that um, we do. So thanks, everyone. Join us next month for Butterflies of Florida.